Chapter 16, the Jewish Epistles, Hebrews chapter 3, part 4, the if-then dilemma. Another controversy arises when Bible teachers or students interpret the following passages from Hebrews chapter 3 as defining conditions for keeping one's salvation. Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Hebrews 3.14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Contrary to what is sometimes taught, these verses do not offer conditions for salvation. Instead, they describe circumstances that follow or are a result of salvation. Those who interpret these passages, conditional salvation, generally refer to the phrase holy brethren in Hebrews 3.1 to point out that Paul addressed believers and not simply Jewish kinsmen. Contextually, these holy brethren were called Christ's house. To this, most Bible believers would agree. The divisive issue surrounds whether Paul was writing that the housing of Christ was conditional upon some manifested type of effort by the believer or if the believers are secure in Christ. Additionally, some would point out under the end and liken it to the end of Daniel's 70th week, but consistency would dictate the same ill-advised treatment. For the phrases are also found in other church age epistles, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, 2 Corinthians 1, 13. Christians are the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, build it together for a habitation of God, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, 1 Peter 2, 5. Simply put, Christ indwells every believer, Colossians 1, 27, Ephesians 3, 17. Those who are not indwelt are simply not saved, Romans 8, 9. If Hebrews chapter 3 teaches a person was indwelt but lost that indwelling, it follows that a man was saved and subsequently lost his salvation. This contradicts so many passages in Hebrews, like the summation given in the final chapter, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13, 5. Two verses earlier, we are told that this promise refers to those in the body, Hebrews 13, 3. The problem with forcing a conditional salvation upon every passage using the if qualifier is that these statements are not limited to the Jewish epistles in the book of Revelation. When Paul wrote to the Colossian saints, unquestionably a New Testament church epistle, he used similar wording to convey a similar truth. The question is, are we to believe that we who are reconciled only remain reconciled if we continue in the faith grounded and settled? Colossians 1.21 And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present to you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith ground and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It is spiritual infidelity to apply a concept unequally when God demands consistency. Those who want to consistently apply the principle they associate to the reading in Hebrews would surely have to look at Colossians as teaching the same type of conditional salvation. Everyone agrees that that would be heretical. In other words, if Hebrews teaches conditional salvation, consistent hermeneutical application would require that Colossians be treated in the same fashion, thus opening Pandora's box. Additionally, the book of 1 Corinthians also contains a bewildering example to a good number of sincere Christians. In 1 Corinthians 15.1, Paul addressed the brethren who had received the gospel. To those who suggest the if statements found in Scripture indicate conditional salvation, we ask, was Paul telling the brethren that they only remain saved if? 1 Corinthians 15.1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. These passages from Colossians and 1 Corinthians are generally explained away or disregarded, while the subject passages from Hebrews are said to infer conditional salvation. Bible believers must be consistent. These types of inconsistencies are quite disturbing. The problem arises due to an unfamiliarity with the proper interpretation of biblical if-then statements. Here's a brief explanation. In this usage, if testifies to actions to be found in the future. 
these future actions serve to substantiate or prove a stated present truth or reality. Contrarywise, then makes a statement about something presently true. However, the statement presently true does not depend upon the future if statement for it to remain true. Note, an implied then follows the same English grammar rules as the understood or implied you. Here are six examples of demonstrating the importance of understanding the Bible usage of if-then statements. Number one, Christ's disciples. John 8:31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, future proof, then are ye my disciples, present truth indeed. The present truth, then, ye are my disciples, the future proof of the present truth or reality, if ye continue in my word. If those addressed by Christ did not continue in Christ's word, they were not presently as true disciples, right? Stop before proceeding. The point is not being made that one becomes a disciple in the future if he continues in Christ's word. The point is being made that disciples continue following God's word or they are not presently as disciples. Disciples continue in God's word. Peter wrote that the believer is to grow in grace, 2 Peter 3.18, and problems arise when others want to determine how or how fast fellow believers should be growing. What was the practice or proof to confirm the claim to be Christ's present disciple? Only those who continue in God's word exhibited the proof of discipleship. Continuing God's word was not the impetus or the origin of becoming Christ's disciple. Believing on him was the impetus of becoming a disciple. Notice the first phrase, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Stop. Be sure to fully grasp this point before continuing. Number two, children of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, By which also ye are saved... A present truth, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, future proof, unless you have believed in vain. The present truth, ye are saved. The future proof of the present truth, or reality, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. If those addressed did not keep in memory what was preached to them, they were not presently saved. In other words, those who remembered what was preached to them exhibited proof of salvation. But remembering what was preached to them was not the impetus or origin of their salvation. If remembering brought salvation, that's works. The impetus of salvation was not a good memory, but a trusting heart. This does not mean that Christians never backslide, because they certainly do. Number three, reconciled believers. Colossians 1.21 And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, present truth, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, future proof, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, made a minister. The present truth, yet now hath he reconciled. The future proof of the present truth or reality, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. If the Colossians did not continue grounded and settled in the faith, they were not presently reconciled. In other words, those who continued in the faith, grounded and settled, exhibited a proof of being presently reconciled. But continuing grounded and settled in the faith was not the impetus or origin of their reconciliation in Christ Jesus. That's works. Reconciliation with God comes only through trusting Christ's sacrificial death upon the cross. If reconciliation comes from continuing in the faith, grounded and settled, then the person is saved by works. Heresy. Number four, the indwelt believers. Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ, the Son of his own house, whose house are we, present truth, if we hold fast the confidence of the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, future proof. The present truth, whose house we are, the future proof of the present truth or reality, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. If the Hebrews did not hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, they were not presently Christ's house. In other words, those who held fast this confidence or rejoicing exhibited proof of being indwelt by Christ. But holding fast this confidence or rejoicing was not the impetus or origin of the indwelling. That's works. Nor was holding fast the prerequisite of retaining the indwelling. Man has a will to go in directions displeasing to his Savior. Number five, partakers of Christ. Hebrews 3.14, For we are made partakers of Christ, present truth, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, future proof. 
The present truth, we are made partakers of Christ. The future proof of the present truth or reality if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If the Hebrews did not hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end, they were not presently partakers of Christ. Footnote number one. Some teachers liken the phrase unto the end to Matthew 24, 13 and other obvious second coming passages because of the preconceived notion as to the primary application of the book of Hebrews to Jews in the tribulation. But it seems more plausible to associate it with another of Paul's epistles in the coming of the Lord at the rapture, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is important to consider the obvious first century audience, church age Hebrew believers, rather than forcing a futuristic application because of a misconception of the book of Hebrews. For example, would Paul have been advising these first century believers concerning the rapture or the second coming as the end? In other words, those who remain steadfast concerning their confidence exhibited proof of being partakers of Christ. But conversely, remaining steadfast was not the impetus or origin of being a partaker of Christ. That's works. Nor was it the prerequisite of continuing to be a partaker of Christ. The future proof of the present truth or reality served as an assurance of the profession. The proof was certainly not the impetus that caused one to be a partaker of Christ. For those who need some additional clarity... The if-then statement principle is again clear in Hebrews chapter 12. It is obvious in this passage that the then speaks to a present truth, and the if identifies the future proof of the present truth or reality. Number six, chastened believers, Hebrews 12, 8. But if ye be without chastisement, future proof, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons, present truth. The present truth, then are ye bastards and not sons. The future proof of the present truth or reality, if ye be without chastisement. Think about it in the way most people read the subject verses in Hebrews. Does the verse say that if you are not chastened, you become bastards? Or does Paul write, those who are bastards experience the future proof through a lack of chastisement from God? Of course it is the latter. Does the lack of chastisement cause someone to become a bastard? Or is the lack of chastisement the indicator of one's state? That is the way to read each one of these if-then statements. In other words, individuals who were not presently God's children were proven to be such by the lack of chastisement. Since future actions cannot be the cause of the present reality, the future actions simply proved or disproved the apparent present condition to be true or false. The point that must be emphasized is that neither of the subject verses in Hebrews chapter 3 teaches the possibility of losing one's salvation. Instead, they demonstrate how an individual can have the assurance of Christ indwelling. This is no different than the assurance one receives when he is chastened by God as a son. These verses, along with others, teach that someone can claim to be saved and go through the outward motions of believing without truly being saved. Verses like this teach that those who turn from God after professing to know Him indicate by their actions that they were never truly saved. The subject passages also teach that one of the proofs of a man's salvation is his faithfulness in serving God. Living for God is the evidence how does one know that he knows God? 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Titus 1, 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. An obedient walk is the evidence of salvation, 1 John. A disobedient walk denies knowledge of God, can indicate a false profession, and certainly offers no assurance of salvation. There is more. If those addressed in Hebrews chapter 3 could lose their salvation, yet get it back, it would have contradicted other clear passages in the book of Hebrews. According to Hebrews chapter 10, the individual perfected was perfected forever through the one offering of Christ applied sacrifice, Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. 
Additionally, Hebrews addressed both the saved, holy brethren, and the brethren, according to the flesh, the Jews, who had remained unsaved. For this reason, not all the Jews addressed in Hebrews were saved. The parable of the sower offers a great application of those who did not believe to the saving of their souls. Luke 8, verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This parable described various reactions to the word of God. According to the interpretation of the parable, the devil allowed some to hear the word, but took it out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved, Luke 8, 12. The seed which fell on the good ground bare fruit. The Jews were warned about this very thing. Those who were unconverted departed from the living God because they had an evil heart of unbelief. Paul addressed his brethren according to the flesh, Hebrews three twelve. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Their departure from the living God only proved their condition of unbelief. From a different perspective, their departure was the natural outcome of unbelief. It is not the abandonment of the saving faith once held, but now lost. That type of teaching is simply some man trying to place his spin upon God's truth. Why the Jewish epistle? The Jewish nature of the book of Hebrews is indisputable, but the questions remain. Why was the book of Hebrews necessary? Why would Paul write an epistle to Jews after he had uttered the words, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Jews, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, Acts 13.46. This pattern of turning the focus toward the Gentiles after the Jews' rejection was repeated twice more during his missionary journeys. Yet all indications point to the fact that Paul wrote Hebrews while a prisoner in Rome after Acts chapter 28. God chose Paul to write this epistle because he was in the best position to understand the thinking of the common law-loving Jew. Paul's testimony reveals how sympathetic he was toward those with a hesitancy to accept the gospel of Christ. However, nobody understood better than Paul the superiority of Christ in relation to everything associated with the Jew's past. All these elements moved Paul to a desire to reach his kinsmen according to the flesh. This compassion, a heart to see the Jews come to Christ, was something Paul could not abandon. Paul wrote repeatedly about his great heaviness and continual sorrow of heart and willingness to sacrifice everything in order to see his Jewish brethren saved. Romans 9, 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Romans 10.1 Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. According to Paul's testimony of the gospel, it is the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. As such, it was Paul's practice during his missionary journeys to first enter the synagogue in every city. Acts 13, 13 through 41, Acts 14, 1, Acts 17, 1 through 3, Acts 17, 10, Acts 18, 1 through 4, Acts 18, 18 and 19, Acts 19, 6 through 8. Once the unbelieving Jews in each area rejected the gospel, Paul announced that he would turn to the Gentiles in that region. Acts 13, 46, Acts 18, 6, Acts 28, 25 through 28. However, that did not change the desire of Paul's heart to reach his kinsmen. In fact, Paul, in disregard to the Spirit's repeated warnings, Acts 20, 22 through 24, Acts 21, 4, and Acts 21, 10 through 14, made a journey to Jerusalem to minister to the Jews. When he arrived, he succumbed to the concerns of some Jews and took a vow to affirm and validate his appreciation for the law of Moses, Acts 21, 15 through 26. As the Spirit had previously warned Paul, the Jews, by and large, turned against him, Acts 21, 27 through 36. However, their rejection of the gospel did not deter him 
from making another appeal to them, Acts 21, 40, and Acts 22, 1 through 21. Once again, the Jews rejected Paul's appeal, Acts 22, 22 through 24, and Paul's life was now immediately in jeopardy. However, Paul had determined beforehand that he was willing to face their dire consequences for an opportunity to reach the Jews. Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry, which I had received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. It would seem as though Paul's great opportunities to reach the Jews were now gone, but God mercifully gave him one final opportunity to avoid the planned execution, Paul appealed to Caesar, Acts 25, 11. Because of his appeal to Caesar, he set sail for Rome, Italy, Acts 27, 1. Paul's zeal to reach the Jews was not going to end simply because his personal contact with them was about to be severely hampered. Instead, he took opportunity from Italy to write his brethren according to the flesh, thus the book of Hebrews. Unlike Paul's other 13 epistles, he would not and could not begin his epistle with his name, so he began with God, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, a designation with a special appeal to the Jews. Paul was burdened for both the believing as well as the unbelieving Jews. These believing Jews would recognize the epistle was sent from Paul by his customary handwritten salutation containing grace, 2 Thessalonians 3.17, Hebrews 13.25. The unbelieving Jews, who would have rejected outright anything Paul wrote, might read this letter so long as it did not mention Paul by name. Unfortunately, the blindness of the hyper-dispensationalist astounds everyone but God. A common argument, sometimes listed as first against Pauline authorship of Hebrews, concerns the supposed lack of Paul's customary salutation written with his own hand. Yet Hebrews contains this salutation. Paul closed the book of Second Thessalonians, stating that every epistle that he wrote contained the salutation of Paul, Second Thessalonians 3.17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. After Paul's statement concerning his custom, he then continues by defining the salutation that was handwritten. Grace be with you. This handwritten salutation was meant to authenticate that the letter was genuine. A salutation a letter is the act of saluting, a greeting, the act of paying respect or reverence, by the customary words or actions, as in inquiring of a person's welfare, expressing to them kind wishes. The salutation has nothing to do with the first word in 13 of Paul's earlier epistles. Yet those blinded by a desire to refute Pauline authorship of Hebrews have stated, Paul signs every book he writes, and his name is the first word of every epistle he writes. Hebrews has no such designation. And then they quote 2 Thessalonians 3.17, implying that Paul's salutation is the first word in the epistle. How sad. If Paul wrote Hebrews, his customary salutation should occur in the epistle, and it does appear in Hebrews and all 13 of Paul's other epistles. For context, his comments concerning his salutation from 1 Corinthians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians are repeated. 1 Corinthians 16.21, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Colossians 4.18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you. 2 Thessalonians 3.17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Check it out. Hebrews contains Paul's customary salutation. He closed the book of Hebrews with grace be with you all. Hebrews 13, 25, grace be with you all. Amen. Here are each of Paul's epistles for those doubting that Paul's salutation could be defined and found in every one of his 14 epistles. Romans 16.24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16.23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 2 Corinthians 13.14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Galatians 1.3, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.2, grace be to you and peace 
from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 2, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with you all. Amen. Colossians 4, 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. 2 Thessalonians 3, 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 1 Timothy 6, 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee. 2 Timothy 4:22 The Lord 2 Timothy 4:22 The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit grace be with you amen Titus 3:15 All that are with me salute thee greet them that love us in the faith grace be with you all amen Philemon 3 grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ verse 25 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit amen Hebrews 13:25 grace be with you all amen so much for no salutation by Paul in Hebrews. The Hebrews epistle obviously portrayed the heart and burden of a man for his own people, the Jewish people. Paul most likely wrote this letter only a few years prior to his death. The hyperdispensationalist claims that there is no mention of distinctive doctrines revealed through Paul like the body of Christ, the local church, or eternal security, yet there are many. Number one, the body, Hebrews 13, 3. Remember them that are in my bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. The church, Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits and just men made perfect. The church, Hebrews 2, 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, Will I sing praise unto thee? Eternal security, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Bible refutes the hyper-dispensationalist. Hebrews served as one final attempt on Paul's part to placate his heart's desire to minister to the Jews. These Jews were the focus of concern in the book of Hebrews. Whether unbelieving Jews needing to know that Christ was superior to their heritage or believing Jews needing assurance that their faith did not contradict their Jewish ancestry. Before any Bible student relegates the epistle of Hebrews to others simply because of the Jewish flavor, every Gentile believer within the body of Christ should consider that many of the Hebrews reading the epistle were also part of that same body. As such, the book of Hebrews is just as relevant today to all Christians as it was during the first century. If that is not sufficient, consider that the writer of Hebrews declared, likely about the same time, that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, Second Timothy three sixteen and 17. He wrote this admonition when writing to Timothy, a half Jew, Acts 16, 1. In the end, it is our personal responsibility before God to ensure that that which we believe and practice from the Scripture is truly scriptural. Pure obedience is difficult any time we fail to accept the Scriptures God-given and for our age. For those readers who have been taught that Hebrews teaches the loss of salvation, consider the clear teaching and the conclusion of Hebrews. It offers eternal security for the believer, and no difficult or obscure passage should be allowed to contradict the clear teaching of Scripture. When will the Lord leave or forsake the believer? Never. Hebrews 13:5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That is the end of chapter 16.